In 1940, RAF Langham was no more than a small satellite airfield of RAF Bertram Newton. By 1944, the site had enlarged to become an independent RAF station which was to remain active into the late 1950s. In 1956, American Army veteran Larry Anderson was posted to Langham. This is his story. We were assigned uh, three of us to Europe, three to uh, uh, Hawaii, and the other three went to Japan. There was nine of us. And when we got Fort Dix, they said, oh, you're going to England. You're going to the 39th AAA Battalion, which was at Fairford. We got to Fairford, and the guy said, oh, well, our Met section is up at Langham. So they loaded us up and brought us up here. That's how we ended up here. Larry was billeted at the communal site on Morston Road. 55 years on, he has come back to revisit his old barracks. God, it's unbelievable. The former communal site on Morston Road was originally constructed during the Second World War. The site once boasted a cinema, gymnasium and a grocer's selling local produce but today, the site is a jungle of thorny shrubs beneath the maturing trees. However, foundations of the many demolished buildings still remain among the undergrowth, surrounded by the original roadways which cross this once bustling part of the base. Armed with a map, drawn from the memory of his friend and former comrade, Richard Stravosky, can Larry tell us more about the many foundations which still survive today? Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, this is a big tall building and then all of our vehicles were parked over on the other side. Outside. Up by the old motor pool, Larry recalled a story involving a cow. Living in Minnesota, I uh, was aware of the different types of cows and everything. Well, I, saw, I saw this cow at the end of the road uh, in the pasture. So I thought, well, I'll walk up and check it out. So I walked up there and the cow was looking or eating and then he looked up and saw me and curious as any cow would be and then he Went back to eating, and so I said, okay. I started back. And I maybe would go on maybe 100 feet, and I turned around for whatever reason. The cow was gone. I thought, oh, no, where'd that cow go? So got to, uh, I went back up to the fence, and there was the cow. He was uh, down in a crater. The grass had gone down, and he was just munched his way to the bottom. He disappeared. Well, there he was. Oh, okay. So then I looked around and I saw a lot of craters, all grass covered, just kind of like what you'd have on a, on a golf course, you know, they have sand in them. And uh, then I asked one of the local uh, gentlemen from uh, Langham, I said, how come all these craters on this field? And he said, well, the Germans, they couldn't find London, they couldn't take the bombs back. It was kind of Land's End right here, we're what, a mile from the North Sea? And so they dropped their bombs. They couldn't take them back to wherever they came from. So they called them a bomb dump. And that's where the cow was eating his grass. To the west of the old motor pool, Larry spots some rather curious remains. Here lies a circular ring of concrete, about 40 feet in diameter. However, the original Air Ministry plans of RAF Langham marked this area as foundations for the site's institute, which was never built. So what was this circle of concrete, which was built on top of these foundations? Oh, well, it's definitely a dome, no doubt about that. We used it for supply and storage. 
and there should be another building over here. The circular concrete remains once formed the foundations of a dome-like structure similar to the remaining dome trainer on the airfield site. After confirming the history of these puzzling remains, Larry then heads over to the south of the site, stumbling across some distinct red floor tiles. You know what this is? The kitchen. But, yeah, this is all mess, all in the kitchen. But this is definitely the, the tile we're on the floor. Although the Met section was based at Langham, their operations were carried out at Weybon Anti-Aircraft Training Camp. What we were training for was to fly weather balloons and uh, well, there are actually 11 artillery zones. We were trained for the artillery, which could be field artillery or anti-aircraft. In our case, we ended up with an anti-aircraft. And um, so we flew the weather balloons to get, to get the humidity, temperature, and around here, more importantly, because of the sea and the air currents, uh, the, the wind speed and wind direction, which was integral for the guns, and this information was fed into the 75 millimeter sky sweeper computers, so they were, made it much more accurate. This is it right here. This is the. Uh, First one ever fired in Europe was fired right at Weyburn Range back in uh, 1954. And what it is, is the, di the dish up here, it's radar controlled. And it's got, a, it's computerized, so uh, that's where we fed our information into the computer and make, to uh, make a, a more accurate shot. And the actual gun would rotate and it doesn't show it here but there was a platform or two ammo the guys were loading ammo into these racks and uh, <clears throat> they uh, had to hang on for dear life when this thing was activated it could it turn in a split second so these guys are hanging on tight and they, there's two operators that sat in seats the Skysweeper guns were set up to the west of Weybourne Camp, overlooking the North Sea, near the location of the three dual-purpose QF 5.25-inch guns, which were used during the latter part of the Second World War. But the faster aircraft of the early Cold War period required much faster tracking, something the radar-assisted Skysweeper could offer. This rendered the QF 5.25s useless in comparison, and the guns were removed by 1956. The guns were there when he got here in 55, and when I got here, there were no guns in the gun pits. So he said there were a few of their coastal artillery. So that's much as I know. However, the guns adjacent underground engine rooms found a new use as storage facilities. Well, we had to use store some stuff, so we used them for storage from some of our uh, supplies. With faster aircraft now in the skies, conventional towed targets used in gunnery training were replaced with smaller, faster, pilotless planes known as ARCATs, which were designed to be shot out of the sky. The ARCATs were considered more effective for training purposes in terms of cost and their ability to maneuver. The Arcats were uh, launched to the west. The guns were set up on the beach of the North Sea. And the Arcats, uh, if the guns were sitting here, then if that was the west, then the Arcats were launched to the west, away from the guns, just in case. And the operator was a master sergeant and he stood up on the top of the uh, beach, or actually above the guns, and he had his little remote control, and he'd run it from right there. And uh, so what they did, <clears throat> they got the motor started, revved up, and they had a Jato bottle, and uh, with a uh, dynamite 
twister and they twisted it and then bang and this thing went out and put a cloud of smoke and that bang that thing was in the air like that away from everywhere. I felt quite safe just standing there to watch it. Didn't have to worry about where it was going to go because it was only going to go in one direction that was straight ahead. And they try to get it into the wind as much as possible. And uh, then you would fly it back and forth and out to sea and bring it in. And, but like I said, once these guns got locked on, it didn't take but an instant and they knocked them down. Then there were, the chute would pop and uh, they'd land in the ocean, in the North Sea, and then there was a fishing boat that would pick them up. The only one exception was when, if there was a, a, a ship on the horizon, a merchant ship of some sort, then they would cease fire until the ship had disappeared. And they had a radar that would pick up the ships, and that was about it. And these, well, I should add, these were batteries that would come up from the various battalions. We had, we had uh, the battalions at uh, Lake and Heath, Fairford, uh, Upper Hayford, and Bryce Norton at that point in time. As well as Weybone, the Met section also had ties with RAF Skilthorpe, which was an American air base. Most of the supplies for the communal site at Langham came from Skilthorpe, as well as the all-important hydrogen used in the weather balloons. We were just at Skilthorpe, which was where we drew all our supplies. And for us, we had to get our hydrogen there. And I think we saw the building where the hydrogen was stored away from everything else out in the middle of the field. And I had to go on taxiways in order to get to the building. We loaded it with cylinders of, uh, of hydrogen, which was used in our balloons. And also we drew all our supplies, our, all our medical services were there. We basically were under the jurisdiction of the Air Force, even though we were Army. Larry recalls a particular incident involving a fighter jet on the taxiways of the airfield. In order to get to the building, which they had kind of out in the middle of nowhere on the on the field, I would have to put a get a checkered flag like you have to on a vehicle that's on the active on the field itself, and so I had to get to uh, to the building to get the hydrogen, and I got on the runway out of the runway, the taxiway first, and here and then a fighter turned onto the taxiway. Well, I was closer to where I had to go, so I just kept going. But the fighter, he kept hitting his brakes, and I could see his nose coming down, and I assume he was probably cursing a little bit, but that was an assumption not ever verified. But I finally got off the taxiway to the building, and then he shot on by. But they didn't want to stop because it takes a lot of fuel to get rolling again. So it was just kind of a cat and mouse for a while. So that was Larry's story. But after 55 years, how does Larry rate his experience of revisiting his old haunt? Yeah, it's been an experience and uh, I see a lot of good things going on and there's a lot of things that can be done and uh, I plan to go to uh, uh, Bushy Hall, which was the headquarters, when talk with some people down there that are doing the same thing. And uh, people here are uh, trying to get some of the things that are left uh, back into some kind of a shape where people can enjoy them for what they were. Because the, uh, some of it was World War II uh, and the other part of it was Cold War, uh, post-war, World War II. So, it's interesting. I think uh, the Norfolk County was a big hub of, or a hub of this activity. <laughs>